Hello, Revelation viewers. I'm at the Clarkson Academy in uh, Ashburnham Place, and they're having a pro-life uh, conference here, and one of the speakers is Greg Cunningham. Hello, Greg. Alan, good to see you. Greg, um, you were a politician, successful lawyer, okay, uh, you were in the armed forces. You gave all that up to do something else. What is it? Uh, to protect mothers and babies from child sacrifice. Well, you must think that that's important enough for you to sacrifice your own career. I actually think it's, it's important to God, and I, I'm often asked if I do this because this is my passion. I do it because it's God's passion, and I fear God, and I will stand before him and be judged by him. And um, when he asks the tough question, what was I doing while babies were being tortured to death all around me, I, I want to have a, a satisfactory answer. Now, in this session, you're going to talk about the historical perspective. So what do you hope to achieve from the audience here? Well, we, we certainly uh, hope to um, urge people to higher levels of activism, and we want that activism to be as effective as possible. But when I came out of my room this morning, I noticed a sign that people had hanging on their doors that says, please do not disturb. And I'm here today to explain the imperative of our ripping this sign out of people's hands and throwing it on the ground and stomping on it because we've got to disturb people. And we've got to disturb them because torturing babies to death is disturbing and people are not sufficiently disturbed by it, and we want to change that. So if our uh, viewers do sort of listen to your talk, they need to expect to be disturbed. And not only that, they need to expect to be equipped and trained to disturb other people. Amen. And not, not gratuitously disturbed, but appropriately disturbed. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you thank for you. the privilege of appearing on Revelation. Okay, Greg. All thank right. You. Bye. All right. <laughs> All right. Should we open in prayer? Any, any dissenting voices? All right. Good. Heavenly Father, we come before you still not really knowing what we're doing and still beseeching you to guide us, to open our eyes, to give us wisdom, to give us courage, uh, to know your will for godly activism. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I have up on the screen a picture of my wife and our three little girls. <laughs> And my, my wife is a public health nurse who founded and directed some of America's first crisis pregnancy medical clinics. So she's very deeply involved in, in uh, crisis pregnancy counseling and in, in post-abortion support kinds of things. Um, and we, we have adopted these three little, little girls who were abandoned uh, <laughs> as a consequence of cleft lip and palate and we know now around the world, cleft lip and palate have become, uh, have become motivators for abortion. It's easier to detect cleft lip and palate in utero, and it's a, it marks these children for, for death very often. And people frequently come up to me in church, and they will say to me, you're, you're such a hero to me for adopting these little girls, and you know, kind of meeting their medical needs, and I stop them and say, please, don't, don't um, heap praise on me for heroism. I was a coward. This was my wife's idea. She was the heroine in this, in this morality play, and I said, we're too old, and we don't have enough money, and we're far too busy. And she said, all true, but we're doing it anyway. <laughs> so, as usual, I just meekly got in line and followed her example and, of course, quickly repented of my 
my, uh, my self-centeredness. But it, it is a rebuke to the church that there even are orphanages. I mean, why, why, why are there orphanages when you stop and think about it? If every Christian family would make room in their home for one little girl or whatever, the orphanages would become obsolete. We, we would empty them out. Why aren't we doing that? Because most Christians were as spiritually immature as I was <laughs> about this, and they had all kinds of certainly reasonable justifications for not doing it, and uh, I was blessed with a wife who would have none of that, and uh, I, I came to share her message, which I'm unworthy to deliver. We, we ought to be adopting these children. When, when we are speaking in a secular forum, we talk about abortion as genocide, because genocide is a, is a peculiar form of atrocity. It's not merely homicide. It's not sort of garden variety, uh, capital murder, premeditated murder, that sort of thing. It's mass murder, and it's mass murder that is systematic in nature, and it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's intended to eliminate a people group. In, in our case, it's unwanted, unborn children are the people targeted for elimination. We use this imagery to, to change the way people think about abortion. We want to make the baby real. We want to make the, the victimization of the baby real. And the most important thing I'm going to say to you today, and, I, and I'll, I'll repeat it, but I certainly want to say it near the top, is that the principal responsibility of a social reformer is to take injustice that would otherwise be invisible and make it visible. Because injustice is almost invariably invisible to the larger culture and, and not accidentally, not coincidentally, perpetrators of injustice go to great lengths to keep what they're doing invisible because they don't want people to be scandalized by it. They don't, they, they don't want the public conscience to be outraged by it and so they try to hide it. They, 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 they attempt to victimize the victim class in, in ways that are not obvious to the casual observer. And as long as injustice remains invisible, it will flourish like a cancer. You can't stop it because nobody even acknowledges that it's going on. And it's exceedingly difficult to make invisible injustice visible not only because the perpetrators of the injustice are, are, are moving heaven and earth to keep what they're doing very, very um, sort of vague and obscure in the public mind, but the public doesn't want to know what's going on. Because if the public acknowledges that these terrible things are going on, they are at least as impliedly accepting responsibility for doing something to stop this. And they know that doing something to stop it is going to cost them something. It's going to be risky. It's going to involve sacrifice. So it's better to not know. So public ignorance about injustice is complicated and compounded by public denial about injustice. The public sort of intuits that what is going on is not a good thing, but don't tell me more. <laughs> I don't want to know more because I already feel kind of guilty about the fact that this is happening and I'm not doing anything about it. And the more you tell me about it, the more guilty I'm going to feel about not doing anything about it. Or maybe the more guilty I'm going to feel about actually participating in it. So I'd, I would just rather not no. So when, when you confront the culture with evidence of society's complicity in a great injustice, everybody gets angry at you. The people who are perpetrating the injustice get angry. The people who are tolerating the injustice get angry. People ask me all the time, does what you do work? Well, it often doesn't look like it, it's working to me, but, it, but God calls us to confront the culture prophetically 
about injustice, and he'll redeem that somehow. It's not obvious to us at the time how he will redeem it, but if, if you look at, the, at, at, at much prophetic ministry in the Old Testament, it just looks like a failure. It just looks like the prophets are losers who are just doing dumb stuff. They're just going around sort of provoking people who, if, with whom there's absolutely no hope of repentance. <laughs> they're just not going to stop doing the awful stuff they're doing, and they're not going to start doing the good stuff they should be doing. And God says, confront them anyway. Tell them anyway. I want a record made of this. I want the record to show that nobody gets to say, I didn't know about this. Nobody gets to say, why didn't somebody tell me about this? We're telling you. So when it comes time to judge, nobody's going to be able to fairly say, gosh, I wish somebody would have warned me about this, alerted me. Over the, the 30 years I've done this work, particularly on university campuses, it's amazing 30 years ago, kids were smarter than they are today. I mean, that's really true. They, they re really were smarter. They were more intellectually honest. They, they had more analytical ability. They, they, they could sort of follow the logic of your arguments, even if, they, even if they disagreed with you. And that is way less true today than it was then. You don't write books for a semi-literate culture. Uh, it, it's very, very difficult to appeal morally to a post-Christian culture where moral clarity has just sort of gone out the window, but people understand pictures. And pictures are an extremely effective way of hijacking people's attention, wrenching them, wrenching their attention away from some trivial sort of thing. P people are like robots today, like zombies with their heads down like this, and they have this device, and they're shuffling along, bumping into one another, bumping into, into lamp posts and, and who knows what. It's extremely difficult to get their attention, but something like this gets their attention. And these pictures are designed to take a very complex message and distill it down so it's comprehensible at a glance. You don't have to think about it or don't have to think very long, and it doesn't take a great deal of analytical ability, and designed to communicate a message in a memorable way, so people aren't likely to forget this very quickly, because we, we, we want to change what happens in people's heads when they hear the word fetus. It, it's actually quite easy to do. We, we have out, in fact, where is it? That's a seven-week embryo. That's a living seven-week embryo, that, that image right there. And, and we want people to see that because when they hear the word embryo, that's, what the, that's the picture we want to go off in their head. Right now, when they hear the word embryo, they think of some microscopic kind of thing that looks like a golf ball rather than a baby. That's seven weeks. I mean, that's lots and lots of babies are being killed at that point, and, and that's what a fetus looks like. So we, we are, are changing their, the mental picture that these words elicit, evoke in, in people's minds, and we're doing that by just showing them the reality of all of this. But, but we also want to change the picture that comes into their mind when they hear the word abortion. And, and over time, even people who who, for whom moral clarity is a sort of foreign concept, if they hear the word abortion often enough, and this picture springs to mind often enough, over time it begins to have an effect on, on their spirit, on their, their sense of right and wrong. And it, it's a process that, that certainly takes time, but we've, we have studied the history of social reform. I said that last night. Um, I'm a, if you'll forgive a personal reference, I'm a retired intelligence officer. Uh, I spent 11 years at the Pentagon uh, doing analytical work, and a, a major part of what I did was adversary studies, studying uh, current and potential adversaries for strategic strengths and weaknesses that could be exploited. Uh, and that's very much what, uh, what we did with the history of social reform. I said, let's figure out what has worked historically and do it. 
and let's figure out what has failed historically and not do that. Because at the end of that process, I discovered that today's pro-life movement, not just in America, but in England and Canada and across Europe, today's pro-life movement is not only violating almost every principle of successful social reform, but most pro-life leaders don't even know the history of social reform. And certainly society doesn't know the history of social reform. So the stuff that I'm talking about today is not theoretical, it's not conjectural, it's not, you know, we got this idea and we're gonna try it and we'll see if it works. What I'm sharing with you has been tried and proven. It works. None of this is my idea. This is stuff that giants, way smarter than I, pioneered, and it works. It worked for them, it'll work for us. So when people argue with me about this, I say your argument isn't with me, it's with Wilberforce, it's with Martin Luther King, it's with Lewis Hine, it's, I mean, all of the giants of social reform who've done this stuff, go argue with them. Don't argue with me, I'm just doing what they did. We're, we're often rebuked by Christians who ask, would Jesus use bloody pictures to make his point? And we, of course, uh, suggest that he already did. That's what the cross is about. It's the bloodiest of bloody pictures. It's the shed blood of Christ. And that image has become the symbol of our faith. And it's a stumbling block to the Greeks, and Paul talks about that. It's, it's, it's a problem for a lot of people because it, it, it was a, a symbol of shame in, in the uh, ancient world, and yet for us it's a symbol of deliverance, of redemption, of, of um, uh, spiritual freedom. And when, when we use bloody pictures, we are simply following the example of our Lord. So if it's unchristlike for us to use bloody pictures, then it was unchristlike for Christ to use bloody pictures. And that seems to me to be somewhat oxymoronic. We'll talk tomorrow about the church and, um, and, and the threshold question here for the church, which we'll develop more fully. Jesus said, love your neighbor, love your neighbor. Uh, in, in response to the question, what do I have to do to be saved? He said, love your neighbor as well as the, as the Lord your God with all your heart. Well, who is my neighbor? Is, an un, is, 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 a, is a child my neighbor before birth, after birth, both before birth and after birth? That question can more readily be answered if people have seen an unborn baby before birth. And we have here a video that, and I've just pulled out a clip from this video that, it, that uses the most astonishing uh, prenatal development imaging technology. It's direct videography. It's not a reflected energy technology such as magnetic resonance imaging or ultrasound or, or something along those lines. This is direct videography. Um, and uh, and we, we use this extensively in front of Christian audiences, not least because it, uh, it takes some of the controversy out of this. What I'm about to show you comes from a film that doesn't even say the word abortion. It's just prenatal development. And there are many, many people who have to see the horror of abortion to be converted, but there are some who can be converted just by seeing prenatal development. Just the, the, the majesty, the grandeur of prenatal development is enough to sort of get them. A touch to the mouth area causes the embryo to reflexively withdraw its head. The external ear is beginning to take shape. By six weeks, blood cell formation is underway in the liver, where lymphocytes are now present. This type of white blood cell is a key part of the developing immune system. Hiccups have been observed by seven weeks. Leg movements can now be seen, along with a startle response. The four-chambered heart is largely complete. On average, 
the heart now beats 167 times per minute. Electrical activity of the heart, recorded at seven and a half weeks, reveals a wave pattern similar to the adults. In females, the ovaries are identifiable by seven weeks. Fingers are separate. And toes are joined only at the bases. The hands can now come together, as can the feet. Knee joints are also present. By eight weeks, 75% of embryos exhibit right hand dominance. The remainder is equally divided between left hand dominance and no preference. This is the earliest evidence of right or left handed behavior. Head rotation, neck extension, and hand to face contact occur more often. Touching the embryo elicits squinting, jaw movement, grasping motions, and toe pointing. Between seven and eight weeks, the upper and lower eyelids rapidly grow over the eyes and partially fuse together. Although there is no air in the uterus, the embryo displays intermittent breathing motions by eight weeks. It's a baby. It's a baby, that's the idea. You watch this and you get the idea, it's a baby. And, and those are just embryos. We didn't even show you a fetus. Those are embryos. A fetus is even more obviously humanoid, as, as it were. And you can show this to people of any age. You can show it to little children. Over and over again, we've had two and three year olds watch this and say, you, you know what they say? Baby. <laughs> they say baby. We don't even coach them. And they just, I mean, they, they know what they're seeing in their, in their little hearts, their little spirit the baby. How come they're smarter than a lot of adults? Because they haven't been corrupted yet. Yep, they have not been lied to yet. All right, so lots of people's minds can be changed by just seeing the humanity of the baby, but there's another demographic, another subset of society that has to see the horror of abortion to be converted. And I'm not guessing that they can only be converted by the horror of abortion. They tell us that, that nothing short of seeing this would have changed their minds. Many, many Christian women have told us they had heard all the arguments. You know, they, they, they knew the facts, they knew the arguments, and they still had abortions because they had never seen an abortion until later, and they said, if only we would have seen before, before our abortion what we saw after, we would not have done it. Because there's certain truth that cannot be communicated by words alone. It just can't. It, it, it really does take imagery. And for that percentage of the population, um, their, their children are, are going to die if we abandon them and, and deny them the influence it would take to convert them. Now, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to show you the horror of abortion in, in video form. And, and what I'm about to show you, uh, to just give you a little bit of context, involves a chain of abortion clinics in Michigan, in, in, the, in, the, in the US. And this outfit is called Northland Family Planning Centers. And I can't remember how many abortion clinics they are in their chain, but it's a significant number. And they hired a very expensive marketing consultants and, and video production consultants and psychologists and all kinds of stuff toward the goal of producing the most persuasive infomercial to sell abortion 
that can possibly be imagined. And they focus grouped it and field tested it and refined it and made it as deceptive as they could possibly make it, as convincing as they possibly could make it. They, they, they used all of the, the, the sort of buzzwords that make people feel warm and fuzzy and sort of disarmed people and obscured the horror of what was going on. And somebody sent me a link to this thing because I, I, I didn't know it was out there and I watched it and I was infuriated <laughs> by this thing uh, because as we discovered later, it was being used to, to enormous effect in luring innocent, sort of unsuspecting young women into a mistake that, that, that had a life-shattering experience. Now, I, I believe, not least because Scripture says God places His truth even in the unregenerate heart, that even unbelievers have some sense of right and wrong. I think every man and woman who participate in an abortion at some level know that what they're doing is wrong. They can intuit that it's wrong. The problem is a high percentage of them don't understand how wrong it actually is. So when, when people say to me, oh, people already know that it's wrong, that's absolutely true, but, it's that, but that's, that's beside the point. The question isn't do they know it's wrong, do they understand the degree to which it is wrong at a level that would dissuade them from doing it. And, and that's where showing it to them becomes so incredibly important. So I said to our staff, let's download this infomercial and let's produce a mockumentary and, and, and simply every time this woman tells a lie, this narrator tells a lie, we'll just insert a few seconds of abortion footage no, no, no narrative, no captioning, we won't call anybody names, we won't say abortion is murder, we won't say the baby's a baby. We'll just insert a few seconds of, of abortion footage and we'll keep doing that over and over and over again down the, 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 the timeline until we get to the end of the video. Um, but here's what this video looks like and, and, and what I want you to bear in mind as you listen to this, their infomercial can only be effective in a, in a culture where people are unimaginably dumb about abortion. I, I mean, you would have to be off the chart dumb about abortion for what you're hearing here to resonate and be convincing and be persuasive and be disarming. And they knew, they knew their audience. They knew their audience was dumb and they, they took advantage of that stupidity with this video. So this video is a rebuke to the pro-life movement. It's a rebuke to the church to allow the culture to become stupid enough about this that this video would work. That's, that's the punchline. And, and, then, and then I'll tell you what the outcome of this was. And I'll caution you, it's tough to watch. It is tough to watch. But God has to watch it. that good women often have to make difficult decisions in life. Since 1973, 45 million good women in the United States have made the decision to have an abortion. One in three women in the United States will have an abortion in her lifetime. You are certainly not alone in making this choice. Deciding to have an abortion is a normal experience. We trust you and we believe you are making your decision from a place of goodness. Goodness is courage, honesty, wisdom, risking for what you believe is right for you. making choices that are good for yourself, 
that recognize your responsibility to yourself and to your family. Goodness is not perfection, it is not obedience, and it is not martyrdom. There is not one way of living a good life, and sometimes we have to make really hard choices. When a woman decides to have an abortion, she is making a choice that is thoughtful, considered, and essentially coming from a place of goodness. It is a sign of strength, courage, and responsibility to thoughtfully consider whether or not to bring new life into the world. It takes a lot of courage to make the decision to have an abortion. When you choose to come to Northland, you will be working with a staff whose courage and vision is a part of our belief in the essential goodness of our work. We have a sign hanging at Northland that reads, we do sacred work that honors women and the circle of life and death. When you come here, bring only love. We believe in the goodness of our work, and we believe in your goodness. Choosing to have an abortion does not make you a bad person. If you need help remembering that you are a good person, we are here for you. The, the civil complaint that was filed that, uh, that alleged copyright violations, in their complaint, they began by saying that this video harmed their reputations and damaged their business. Think about that. All the video does is take their lies and rebut them by just inserting a, a few seconds of abortion imagery. And just that they said, harmed their business and damaged their reputation. Now, what, what would that tell a person of, of average intelligence might be the way forward for the pro-life movement? This is an extremely influential abortion provider in the United States saying, if you want to harm our reputation and damage our business, just show people what we do. Uh, and this is not hard. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing sort of complicated about this. This is exactly why Ann Ferrady is going to Parliament and saying we want buffer zones around our abortion clinics to keep these pictures off our sidewalks. Because we don't want women outside the clinic to see what we're doing inside the clinic. And there's just nothing hard about this. Why, why isn't every pro-life group doing this? Why are 90% of the pro-life groups in the world collaborating with the abortion industry's attempt to hide the horror of abortion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't get that, but it's exactly what is happening. William Wilberforce, for 30 years in Parliament, spoke against the slave trade. He wrote essays that were published in all the major newspapers. Every chance he got to speak from the floor of Parliament, he did. He was out speaking in, in, in civic organizations and what have you. And the net effect of that, in the aggregate, on public opinion regarding the slave trade, was nothing, <laughs> zero, nothing changed. Nobody was listening to him. Because, and, and even the slave traders weren't afraid of William Wilberforce's words. 
And so William Wilberforce had an epiphany, uh, along with Thomas Clarkson and the Clapham Circle, the abolitionists, it, it, it occurred to them that the problem they were dealing with was that slavery in Britain wasn't in Britain. It was in the British West Indies. And almost nobody in England had ever seen a slave. Now, th they liked rum, sugar, molasses, coffee, tea, and they liked the commodities that black people were being tortured to death to produce, but they had no concept of the human suffering that was being endured to produce those commodities. And so it occurred to the abolitionists, we've got to make this real to the British people. We, we, we have to at least graphically bring slavery from the British West Indies to England and make people look at it. And that changed everything. And a, a, a guy like Blake, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, a, a man by the name of Blake, who was a very gifted illustrator, came up with these extremely horrific illustrations of black people being tortured to death. And he was, and th these were historically accurate depictions. This wasn't stuff that he was exaggerating for, for dramatic effect. And it really did change everything. Uh, and, and, and suddenly, white people started signing petitions against the slave trade, and they started boycotting these, these commodities being produced by black people. And William Wilberforce went from being this avuncular, sort of admired elder statesman, to, to being so reviled that he had to be accompanied by armed guards because death threats were raining down on him. Uh, the, Thomas Clarkson came within an inch of being beaten to death. The pictures changed everything. And this is a classic example of, of William Wilberforce being liked but ineffective and then becoming effective in ways that caused him to be disliked. This incompatibility between being liked and being effective is nowhere better illustrated than in the life and work of William Wilberforce. Was Wilberforce an American? No, he was an Englishman from whom we learned, and here's Frederick Douglass, the great American abolitionist who made repeated trips to England to confer with whom? William Wilberforce and to take Wilberforce's strategy and tactics and apply them in the United States. And yet the press in the UK is saying that using shocking imagery is an American tactic that is being exported to England. I mean, how dumb is that? Uh, it, it, with, the, with the abolition of child labor in the United States, it was pictures that made the difference. And you had a, a, a very, closely analogous situation to the abortion battle because the, the injustices by which these children were being victimized uh, were, uh, were visited on them behind closed doors of factories and mills and, and down in coal mines where nobody had to look at, at the terrible conditions that were breaking children's health and keeping them out of schools. And everybody got angry about these pictures. Lewis Hine died in poverty. I mean, he was so anathematized. He's the photographer who pioneered this. Everybody hated the guy because nobody wanted to pay more money for coal. I mean, it was a coal-based economy, and certainly parents wanted the income from their children in the mines. But when these pictures, when everybody had to look at the pictures, the, the level of guilt that the pictures elicited made it impossible for people of conscience to tolerate all of this, but it was the pictures, but the pictures were so unpopular that Lewis Hine was vilified almost everywhere he went. He actually made the observation that people were angrier at him for displaying the pictures than they were at the, at the people who were victimizing the children, because the people victimizing the children weren't bothering anybody. He was bothering people. Do not disturb. <laughs> Don't disturb me. <laughs> We're here to disturb people. Who is better able to use the pictures than Holocaust memorial uh, activists? And the 
motto never again is sustained by that sort of imagery. Emmett Till was a young boy in the late 1950s in, in, the, in the American South who was tortured to death uh, and, and his body was shipped home to Chicago where he had grown up in a sealed coffin that was bolted shut because the authorities did not want anybody to see what had happened to this little boy. And his mother insisted over the objection of the funeral director that the coffin be pried open and that she said, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. And the photograph in the lower right was actually taken by a press photographer for a publication called Jet Magazine. It appeared in the Detroit Defender. Th these were black publications. And when Rosa Parks, do, do you all, does the name Rosa Parks mean anything? She's the, the, the woman on the school, on the, on the bus who would not get up and go to the back of the bus. Uh, she was asked years after that that sort of heroic display of courage, what, what inspired her to take the risks that she had to take to refuse to go to the back of the bus? She said, I saw the picture of F. Emmett Till. I saw the picture of Emmett Till. And her courage in not being willing to go to the back of the bus motivated Martin Luther King, who was a black pastor in Montgomery, Alabama, to, 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 to launch a boycott of the Montgomery bus system. Black people said, you know, if you're gonna arrest a woman, a black woman who won't go to the back of the bus, we're not gonna ride the bus. And that bus boycott gave rise to the entire civil rights movement in the South. It was a horrifying picture that, that set in motion this series of events that gave rise to the civil rights movement and so Martin Luther King said, the best way to take, um, the best way to fight invisible injustice is to make it visible. Now, th th this is an, in an interesting story, and I'm gonna try to accelerate this because I, I, I wanna leave time for questions and, and comments. King got the idea that the, the problem he was facing was the same problem William Wilberforce faced when a, when a black person in Selma, Alabama, or Montgomery, or, or, or Birmingham, Alabama, whatever, when, when they would try to register to vote, they would not be denied a voter registration form. They'd be given a voter registration form. They'd fill it out often. And, and I mean, let's lay aside the poll taxes and literacy tests and the other stuff that was going on. Frequently, they, they would be given a voter registration form. They'd fill it out, it'd be turned in, and nothing would happen. It just wouldn't get processed. So their name would never appear on the voter registration rolls and they couldn't vote. Well, you, there, you, you can't take a picture of that. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing outrageous that you could take a picture of and hold it up and say, isn't this awful? And the same thing was true when a black person would apply for a job. And they, they might fill out an application, but they'd never get called for an interview. And so King said, we, we gotta get a picture of this that becomes a proxy for this injustice, emblematic, sim symbolic of the injustice. So we'll march against this and we'll be denied the permit, but we'll march anyway. And when we march without a permit, the police will arrest us and we'll arrange for the, I'm sorry, the police will arrest us, we'll arrange for the news media to be there and take pictures of this because the arrest will be rough. And so, he, and so King says, where, where should we start this? And he picked Albany, Georgia, because Albany, Georgia was a place where there was a great deal of racial discrimination going on, but he made a mistake. King made a mistake. The mistake he made was that Albany, Georgia's police chief, a guy named Laurie Pritchett, was actually a polite racist. And he, he arrested King and the protesters without using dogs and fire hoses and you know, police with clubs on horseback. He just quietly, politely put them in handcuffs, gently put them in the paddy wagon and took them off to jail. And so the press ignored the whole thing. 
because there, there was no conflict that was obvious and dramatic and, and uh, confrontational. And so King analyzed what happened in Albany, Georgia, and he said that didn't work out so well because the police chief was too polite. So let's figure out, let's, let's survey cities in the South and figure out where there's a police chief who's not gonna be polite. And so they went to Birmingham, specifically because the police chief in Birmingham was a guy named Bull Connor. Now, no mother names her baby Bull. <laughs> That's a name you have to earn by being brutish. And, and he, he did earn that name over time. And he fell right into Martin Luther King's trap by bringing out the dogs and the horses and the fire hoses and all the rest of it. And that attracted the police and it dramatized invisible injustice in a way that was visible. This is a picture taken in the, in the 1960s in the, in the deep south. Uh, and these are Ku Klux Klan members or sympathizers and the fellow who's bent over on the left is a press photographer and they're trying to get his camera away from him. You see the camera hanging down? See the camera? They're, they're, they're trying to get the camera away because they know that it's a bad idea to let pictures be taken of the Klan abusing black people. So frequently, before the Klan would attack black people, they would look for the press photographers and they would attack the photographers and get their cameras away, destroy their camera, or whatever. And there's a police officer casually strolling by in the background, obviously not too concerned about any of this. And that's an old problem. This is Myanmar, and th these are pro-democracy demonstrators. And you can see in the exact center of the photograph uh, a, a man with a club who's wading into these pro-democracy demonstrators and beating them back. And in the lower right is um, a press photographer who has been shot by a military guy who was going through the crowd looking for people with cameras and killing them. Because nobody who's involved in oppressing innocent people wants pictures to be taken of it. And this happens over and over again. The press has no misgivings about using bloody imagery when it's, when it's in, in, in the service of their political narrative. When the press is trying to mobilize public support for relief efforts in, in response to a, na a natural disaster, they'll put a dead baby, that's, there's a dead child, put the picture right on the cover, grieving parents, no problem at all. All right, we use these pictures on university campuses because no one will debate us. The professors won't debate us. And when on the few occasions when a professor will debate us, they insist that no pictures be used. That's the condition on which they agree to the debate. And almost nobody comes to the debate. The crowds are very small. So we said, let's take the pictures and set them up in the middle of the campus and we'll force a debate and we'll make everybody look. And almost every place we set up this display on a university campus, the Crisis Pregnancy Center director in the local area experiences and is able to document a substantial rise in the numbers of women in crisis pregnancy who go to the Crisis Pregnancy Center instead of going to the abortion clinic. Uh, that, that's a quantifiable difference in the way women respond to a, a problematic pregnancy after they've seen these pictures vis-a-vis -vis their response before they've seen them. The signs are intended to be provocative and, and, and to address these constantly recurring but vacuous slogans, the other side chants, it's my body. Well, then whose body is this? We hear, what about rape, all the time? And it, it would be difficult for you to read that, but the caption says, some cultures execute innocent rape victims and call it honor killing. 
Our culture executes innocent babies of rape victims and calls it reproductive choice. Are we less barbaric for killing the baby than they for killing the mothers? Stop executing the innocent. Since we began to display that sign, the number of sort of mocking questions about rape have fallen by easily 95%. I mean, that sign just preempts that canard. It just kind of goes away because it's so, it's, the, the, the sign itself is so convicting. Before and after pictures can be used extremely effectively. There's a living baby right before an abortion, a dead baby of the same age, torn apart right after an abortion. It's the contrast, the juxtaposition of life and death that is troubling to people. Uh, in the Western world, animal rights are, are venerated, and, and, and so a picture of a whale being slaughtered beside a picture of a, of a baby who's been slaughtered uh, tends to change the way people think about animal rights vis-a-vis -vis the rights of the unborn. The insanity of choice. The, the baby on the left is a 24-week preemie. The baby on the right is a 24-week aborted baby. Uh, and the cognitive dissonance that creates is just, just mind-boggling. Child abuse. Abortion is the ultimate form of child abuse. Nobody argues that parents should have the right to abuse born children, so why do they have the right to abuse unborn children? Again, that juxtaposition is quite powerful. Gender side, all these little girls who are being aborted and abandoned to infanticide, um, that's a real problem for, for feminists. Intellectual genocide, 90% of children diagnosed in utero with Down syndrome, which is now detectable at nine weeks, are being aborted. We want people to see what that looks like. So we show them a nine-week aborted baby on the right, and of course, dear little girl on the left. Cosmetic genocide, cleft lip and palate. That's Alice May Lou on the left. She wants, she wants her sign used. And the first time we displayed it was uh, on a campus in New York, and a local television station came out and, and did a two-minute interview, and somebody sent me the link, and I called Alice over, and I said, Here, here's your sign on television. And she watched it without saying a word, and at the end of the video, she turned to me and said, I was saving babies, and I wasn't even there. <laughs> All right, this is the end. That's almost the end. Um, I remember when y'all came here three years ago, um, you were out on the green instead, um, which was like the, the metropolis, the, the heart of the campus back then. But I walked by uh, and saw these pictures and thought, you know, I, I was pro-choice at that time, so um, it made me really angry. Um, I was one of the heavy debaters. I, uh, you know, I thought, oh, if your, your argument must be so weak that you have to use, you know, these pictures. And I thought it was disgusting, um, but it followed me home and it followed me for several days and I, I went online and looked up a video of an entire abortion and I cried until I couldn't breathe and um, I changed. I, I changed at that moment from pro-choice to pro-life and I know that it was because I saw these pictures and I think what people, what people do, why people go, get so upset is because when you see a baby in pieces like that, you can't help but feel some kind of bad feeling. You feel angry or sad or disgusted or scared or guilty, um, but you can't escape the truth. And these pictures show the truth. There's nothing you can, there's nothing you can argue <laughs> with that. So um, I, 
totally support what you guys are doing. Um, it changed my life, changed the way I think. Um, and I and I don't think that women are, are who get abortions are evil and terrible people. I I see them as victims. I see them as people we can help. And um, I don't know. I think this is a great project.